Thank you for your patience. I'm so glad that you took time out of your busy day to come to Conversations at South. Before we get down to the real business of our guest this evening, Nelson George, I just wanted to share some brief remarks about what it is, who I am, and why we do this. Um, I am the, my name is Vanessa Lloyd Scambati, and I am the founder of the Literary Media and Publishing Consultants. And essentially, it's a PR and marketing firm. And I've been around for 26 years, and I've worked with the creme de la creme in the publishing industry. We started to do these events because Robert and Benjamin Bynum, who are part of a legendary family of music and food and entertainment, um, Robert wanted to extend the stage, the music stage, to the literary world. So I'm glad he's doing that. He's somewhere back there, and Ben is in the kitchen making fabulous food. But I jumped on board immediately because I support, push, shove the whole children's industry here, book industry here in Philadelphia. I'm the founder of the African American Children's Book Fair, and if you come to Philadelphia first Saturday in February, you'll see a line at 10 a.m. of young people, parents, caregivers, educators, waiting to get inside to buy books, over 4,000 people. How many people have ever attended the event? So you know, and you're second generation, we now have adults who attended as children after 26 years, and we have the best and the brightest from the literary community. So this was an opportunity not only to showcase the literary stage here, but also the proceeds of the book sales supports the African American Children's Book Fair. So you, when you buy a book, you're also buying a book for another child. And now I'm gonna pass the mic to someone who's gonna give Nelson George a proper welcome here in Philadelphia, and someone who is a legend in the entertainment industry and who's always oh so fabulous, Deanna Williams. Thank you, Vanessa. I'd like to greet you all in peace and welcome to one of Philadelphia's most exciting locations, destinations for food and opportunity for us to come together as comrades. And I want to extend a very warm welcome, brotherly love and sisterly affection to producer, director, filmmaker. He is a broadcaster. He is also uh, a very noted cultural champion. You've seen him in many documentaries. And today we are celebrating him in Philadelphia as an author. He's written many, many, many books. But today we're going to focus on one specific, his latest novel. And um, we are thrilled to have with us at Conversations at South, Mr. Nelson George. Please join me in welcoming him. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? It's so good to be here. Uh, Philadelphia is a, obviously a great city, um, great city of music. I've been coming here. So actually, the first time I came to Philadelphia, I believe, was for the Black Music Association first event, which was in 70... Long time ago. Not, not something like that. Yeah. And what century? Uh, what century? It was, it was, but uh, it was, um, I, was, I never forget it because it was my first time here, and it was this gathering of all the powers that be in Black music at that time. Um, and um, I've come here so often to interview folks, and a lot of books that I've written have, have Philadelphia's played a huge role in. And Deanna has been a friend of mine forever, and she's actually in a couple of my books as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to, to be with Sam. Well, one of the books was The Death of Rhythm and Blues, and Nelson gave me the courtesy of calling me and saying, I did an interview with Barry Mayo, who's a well-known <laughs> broadcaster, um, owned many radio stations and ran um, Hot 97 in New York for a period of time. He said, when he was a student at Howard University, because I started my career at WHUR, he said that you used to broadcast in the nude. I was like, please do not put that in the book. I did not broadcast naked. I don't want my children, grandchildren seeing that. It just felt like it. It felt like it. It sounded like I was naked in your bedroom. Kind of how I sound on Sundays with Derek Sampson. But uh, thank you for changing that, correcting, amending that, that erroneous That was Barry's fantasy. That was Barry's saying. fantasy. I yeah. like that. I'm going to tell yeah. him you said so. Yeah, I'll quote you. But Nelson, you've had a very, you are having, not have had, because it's still going on, 
Uh, and we were talking about marveling about the fact that we are both senior citizens because, as he mentioned, we met in the 20th century. Way in the 20th century. In, yeah, in the 20th century. Nelson used to be the editor at Billboard magazine for black music. And so he was documenting the music and the people making it as it was happening, which is part of why he has his finger on the pulse of, of our culture as it relates to specifically black music. He knows about American culture in general, but African American culture specific. Well, because uh, when I was coming up, you know, I, I looked around. Most of the books I read about American music, be it jazz, blues, R&B, rock and roll, were all written by white writers. And very few of them were written by people who were participants in it. And I say when we're black people, you may not be a musician, but the, the, our music comes out of a communal experience. The way that people dance affected the way musicians played. Um, the thing that really made me want to be a music writer, I read a review in Rolling Stone magazine of the Brothers Johnson Stomp. Everybody take it to the top, they're going to stomp all night? Yeah. Right? And I said to myself, the guy who wrote this review doesn't dance. <laughs> you know, because he was writing about this record like it was like a Bob Dylan record. And this record's a fun, and this guy, if you dance, you felt that record. And so I, I said, so much of the music, so much of our culture is being critiqued or, has, or documented by people who aren't participating in the rituals of the black community. And so that was really my, my, uh, my uh, that thing that really made me think to leap from someone who kind of read reviews to want to write reviews. And um, I feel like the whole journey of my career has been to be part of and trying to take that, that colloquial experience that we have with the music and translate it uh, so that other generations later can have it and to be part of the dialogue uh, as it's being consumed. And that, that was really the drive, you know. Um, the whole time I was at Billboard, I basically was a black music editor at a trade publication from 81 to 89, which turned out to be a lovely time because it was the birth of hip hop on record. Prince, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, um, the whole transition that happened from acoustic-based drums and basses to synthesizers, 808s, 808s and yeah. how that happened and how controversial that was at the time. Prince, obviously, uh, had a big part to do with that. And then, you know, the transition and also how that, how that rise in black music also affected other mediums like film. And so I was able to make, a, by the end of the decade, I was able to make a transition into film and TV more because of the work the, tr the way that black music was driving soundtracks allowed opportunities for other, for me and other people around it to get into that game. And the films you're referring to are Strictly Business and CB... CB4. Four. With Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. With Chris Rock. Yeah. His best friend. Yeah. One of his best yeah. friends. He has high-powered celebrity friends. They weren't celebrities when I met them, believe me. I know, right? <laughs> they weren't high-powered become... either. <laughs> well, they've become that now, and yeah. rich. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, th that you made your but that, transition. But that's only because of the culture. I mean, the truth is that the, the, there was an explosion of... I always say there was a, a, a media civil rights movement in the mm -hmm. 80s. When I say that, I mean, when you look at Oprah, Eddie Murphy, uh, Prince Michael, Lionel Richie, people sort of forget how big Lionel was and his importance mm -hmm. in that. Whitney... Uh, even looking at um, Brian Gumbel on NBC becoming, you know, there was all these different uh, kind of breakthroughs that happened during the 80s that uh, opened doors for other people to come in and made it made things that were that were extraordinary in the 70s normal, so that we take for granted now that that black people are on all these TV shows. Which, How about that? Which we never that was that was something that happened in the 80s that we began these breakthroughs at at, at the network level. You know, people forget how revolutionary Brian Gumbel was hosting the Today Show. That was a big deal. Yes, it was. And, and, and it goes hand in hand at the same time Oprah's doing what she's doing. Uh, and then even into people like jazz, when Winton came out and, and sort of tried to reclaim a certain kind of jazz, uh, he was a very important figure. So all these different things happened that sort of, where we, we, we had a chance to begin to redefine in our own words more of our experience. And I, I feel like that was an important time. So I, was, I feel like I was lucky to have you were at the right place at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but also, Nelson, you had your finger on the pulse. I mean, you grew up in this music. You know this music. You love this music. And so we might mention uh, some of the books that came out of that period of time. You did the Michael Jackson book. You did a Motown book. You did... Death um, Rhythm Blues. Death, 
my favorite. I mentioned earlier, Death of Rhythm and Blues. And actually, one of my favorite ones that people that people sleep on is uh, it's called Elevating the Game. And it's actually Your basketball a basketball book. A book on basketball was an attempt to write about basketball as if I was writing about music. So it, it looks at, from Bill Russell to Wilt Chamberlain, I just passed the big mural for Wilt Chamberlain, all the way up. That book ended with uh, in the era of when Barkley was considered like a radical figure. You know, well, you, know <laughs> you know, wow, right? That's how. Yeah. <laughs> now he's a concern. But, I mean, but at the time, Barkley was considered, a, people forget Barkley spit on people in the sidelines. Yeah. He was considered a rebel. Radical. Oh, it's Chuck D, rebel in his own mind. <laughs> So, so you wrote this slew of mostly music books. Yeah, I mean, music is is the through line of my of my life, and um, even even when I've tried to escape uh, uh, the music, it, it it pulls you back. Well, if we discuss the D Hunter series, which we are obviously, because the latest book is To Funk and Die in L.A., music is a thread through your references to, and of course, for the first three books, they took place in New York. Right. D well, first of all. Let's describe who is D. Hunter. Well, I mean, I, I, I was watching a newspaper one time, and um, I saw a picture of uh, Britney Spears, and it was a huge black man, like basically bodyguarding Britney Spears. I said, "Who is that guy? What is his life like?" And I always knew the brothers at the door, at every club, you know, like that big brother at the door. You know, hey man, let me in. You know, that that guy. And so I started talking to these guys who were doormen. Uh, security guards. I met a guy who was a security for, um, who's that guy from South, white guy from South Africa, had a whole, black band, he was really big for a while. Dave Matthews. Dave Matthews. So Dave Matthews had a black bodyguard. And so I started, I met this guy, and I ran into him on a subway. And we ended up having a long talk. So I said, this is an interesting world. What is this guy, the man on the edge of the frame, kind of. And so that, that sort of drew me in, and I started thinking about who this guy was. And there was an article that happened during the height of the crack era that really struck with me. There was a family in Brooklyn, where I'm from, where there were three sons. And one of them was shot in 87, one was shot in 89, one was shot in 92. All related. Some of them were in the game. Some of them were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I thought, what if you were the last brother? What were you the, the brother who survived the violence? What would that do to you? So, so the D. Hunter character is a product both of the world of entertainment but also the world of, of, of kind of the, the violence that, that, especially in that 90s crack era where it seemed like you could get shot just by walking out your house. And so he's obsessed with security. He's obsessed with protecting people. He's obsessed with music. And so all of these different things, threads came together. So he's moved to LA. We find D. Hunter right. in Los Angeles now as opposed to Soho, Brooklyn, right. Manhattan, where he lived before he moved to Brooklyn. And he's... His grandfather's died. Right. So tell us a little bit about the book without giving away the cat. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, basically, it, it, I was obsessed. Uh, anybody remember the movie Chinatown? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I saw that when I was a teenager. I thought it, so L.A. and the idea of the underneath of L.A. always uh, uh, intrigued me. The first trip to L.A. was in 1981 or 82. Being a New Yorker, I want to go someplace where I can walk. So I go to Hollywood Boulevard. Now, this is in the era of Hollywood Boulevard. Now, they've kind of banned it. Back then, you used to have cruising. So the cars would be just going real slow. And people would be throwing each other's phone numbers across. And I was like, wow. And every car at that time was playing Rick James. Give It To Me Baby was blasting out of every convertible on Hollywood Boulevard. So funk and Rick James and L.A. became obsessed, connected. And then, as you know, L.A. in the 80s, there was, there was Carlos and Charlie's, and there was Roxbury's, and there was a whole scene where black music was very much active. And you could go out and uh, you'd see Eddie Murphy or Mike Tyson or any of those figures. I remember seeing Rick James at this place, Roxbury. And Rick would be up on the banquette with like a bronze and a blue net, brunette, right? And Rick would, you know, be doing what Rick does. <laughs> you know? And uh, so you, I just remember, I have a vivid memory of all of that world of, of the Gap Band, who were, who were on a label out of LA, and, and Lakeside. And the fact is, it was a real, I mean, I remember we had a party in, in L.A. dancing to, to no, more bounce to the ounce for like a half hour. <laughs> so that, that world, which is actually that, that part of L.A. is really dissipated. The black community in L.A., much like a lot of cities, has dissipated out. And it's, it's very hard now to find that, that kind of rooted black community in Los Angeles. Um, 
And so about four years ago, I was working on a show, beginning of the show, called The Get Down, which I worked on on Netflix. Remember The Get Down, not long ago, Netflix? Yeah, I'm a yeah. writer. I was a writer producer on that yes. show. And um, so I got a chance to live in L.A. for a summer. And that sort of, I started winding around trying to look at, I noticed that Koreatown and Crenshaw are really close together. And then on the other side of Koreatown is what they call Pico Union or Ramparts. So you had, re that's, Ramparts Pico Union is like being in Central America. Koreatown, you have the big Korean community. And then Crenshaw, you have this traditional black community. So out of that melting pot, I thought there's a great story. Um, and there's one character, and I'm going to read something after I, yes, I, I do Yes, absolutely. Uh, so about four years ago now, I did a documentary called Finding the Funk. And it was a history of funk music was on VH1. But my whole goal the whole time was, can I, can I find Sly? Can I, can I find Sly, right? So Facebook, of course. Someone says, well, Sly's, one of Sly's daughters is on Facebook. So I hit her up on Facebook, and I started talking to her. And she said, well, yeah, I, I think my daddy will do it. And uh, you just have to bring a, a, vanilla, a vanilla envelope with some cash in it. <laughs> Which I did. I round up some cash and stuck it in a vanilla envelope. And I went out to uh, Culver City. And I'm sitting there, like, waiting. Is Sly going to actually come? Right? You know, because he don't come to concerts where he's getting paid. <laughs> and uh, Sly showed up. And it was, a, it was only maybe about a 40-minute conversation, but it was the most remarkable conversation of my life. Because I never thought I'd actually talk to Sly. He's like the great white whale. Like, he's out there, the mystical figure of, of black music. Uh, and so I said, I have to write more about Sly. And so I created a character called Dr. Funk. And Dr. Funk is a key, key character in the book uh, that everyone's trying to find. Some people, want, oops, some people want Dr. Funk's music. Some people want Dr. Funk's image. Some people want Dr. Funk's uh, to pay a price for some transgressions from his past. So the opening chapter of the book is about Dr. Funk, and it sort of gives you a little bit of the tune or the so flavor. So you'll read a little? It's, it's not that long. OK. Uh, each chapter is named after some part of LA. This is called To Funk in Santa Monica. And anybody who's been to Santa Monica knows that that's a, it's a big leap to say funk in Santa Monica. OK, chapter one. At first, no one really paid attention. He was just another gray-bearded, raggedy-looking old black man pushing a metal laundry cart across the Santa Monica promenade. The homeless had made this liberal city by the ocean their residence of choice for decades. And, annoying as they were, the locals had become expert at ignoring them. Even when the old man stopped near the AMC multiplex and pulled up a beat-up mini Moog synthesizer, a small Marshall amp, and a teeny generator from his cart, the shoppers headed to Pottery Barn and Steve Madden kept their distance, and wisely held their noses. It was only after he squatted on two milk crates, pressed his long brown fingers into the yellowed keys, that a couple of curious souls slowed down, he magic in those wrinkled fingers. When he opened his mouth to sing, a magnificent sound emerged. It was a choir in a southern backwoods church. Working people drink in the Midwestern bar. The rustle of sequined shirts and star-spangled pants. The chemical stink of jerry curl juice the wind in Africa, and the prayers of those kind beings who left us the pyramids. Each passerby heard him differently. For one woman, he was the sound of her grandmother's favorite song. For an aging hip hop head, he was a sample used by Biggie, a Tupac, or Raekwon. To a bunch of folks on the Santa Monica Promenade, it was a new sound that made the latest things on the radio seem like Mozart heard through ear earbuds. He was lean, and he was old, but he was a mountain. Smartphones appeared and images were recorded. Tents were applied and snappy captions concocted. Selfie Nation took over Santa Monica Promenade. People angled to include themselves in pics near, next to, and almost on top of this gray-bearded revelation. On his keyboard was a small cup, which began filling with quarters and dollars and one welcome $20 bill. It was all good till a man, man close to the keyboard said, I think that's Dr. Funk. And then it was over. The old man shut his mouth, his fingers left the keyboard, and he glanced around at the crowd like a turtle outside a shell. He stood up, or rather half stood, half bent, and swiftly slid his gear back into his laundry cart. Several people tried to engage him, but his replies were a low mumble or a distant stare. From the old man's pocket, pocket appeared a shiny new Samsung, seemingly his only possession from this century. He tapped his Uber app, confirmed a pickup point, and pushed his cart towards Santa Monica Boulevard. 
A white woman claimed she saw him at the Hollywood Palladium in 1982, though he had shown up two hours late. A man walked next to him saying he had a vinyl copy of Dr. Funk and the Love Patrol's classic, Chaos Phase One, that he loved to get signed. To their consternation, the old man pressed on, determined to meet his Uber and ignore their conversation. Then an imposing man in a salt and pepper hair, a serious tan, and an expensive suit appeared by his side. I saw a video on Instagram. I'm Teddy Tapscott. I'm a movie producer. I was associate producer of Straight Outta Compton. My partner and I are anxious to set up a meeting with you. Dr. Funk said, so you associate with producers? I used to do that too. Now I'm too busy. You deserve a biopic. You deserve a biopic. Dr. Funk said, see that man over there? The musician gestured towards sleeping homeless man. He deserves a meal. What do you deserve? Tapscott held out his business card. The old man ignored him and kept moving. The old man said, you saw me sing, right? Yes, yes, on Instagram. Dr. Funk turned and looked at him and said, you're welcome, and then waved down the waiting Uber. After dumping his gear in a trunk and avoiding eye contact with the disappointed producer, the man known as Dr. Funk, who was the soundtrack for millions, a sage for thousands, and a band leader for a select few, negotiated his lean, bony frame into the back seat of a white Hyundai. The car headed east in the direction of wherever he was living these days. And like the melodies he just played, Dr. Funk evaporated into the moist Santa Monica night. Ooh. You dedicate the book to Sly and to Rick James and uh, I want to say. And Maurice. And Maurice White, Maurice the White. founder of Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right. Well, how did uh, you explain Rick James? Right. But well, Maurice. I mean, uh, uh, to me, uh, one thing about funk, uh, funk music is that uh, funk music was a music that came out of the Midwest. It came out of Cincinnati Ohio, yeah. and Ohio. Dayton, Ohio had an amazing amount of slave Ohio players, Junie Morrison. Um, I'm, I'm drawing. A, why am I drawing a blank? Lakeside. Lakeside. Mm -hmm. I'm drawing a blank. There was a ton of oh. A Steve Arrington. There were just so many bands that came out of that area. And if you look an hour away, it's Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. That's where Bootsy's from. And also, James Brown recorded most of his, a lot of his records in Cincinnati because that's where King Records was. Mm -hmm. and then you go up and you go to Detroit. People always think about Paul and Funkadelic, but a lot of those, most of those records were made in Detroit. At a, uh, so there's a whole kind of, and Princess from the Midwest, there's a whole Midwest thing. And then these guys went to LA. Mm -hmm. or New York, but mostly to L.A. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought, like, you know, Earth and the Fire was started in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so just this idea of, of the journey of these guys to Los Angeles and what the city did to them, what they benefited from and also what it took from them. Well, another thing I love about the book is that L.A. is a character, a major yeah. character. And as you noted, each chapter makes a reference to a neighborhood, a community, in LA. Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of, I mean, uh, I, want, I, I, I walked around LA, which was very helpful. Nelson doesn't drive. Yeah, yeah, I'm a real New Yorker. A real Brooklynite. And um, so I walked through Koreatown, and I walked through Pico Union, and so I got a sense of these places. I actually, actually, my favorite experience, so I said, okay, how many of these people know what a narco corrida is? Anybody? So narco corridas are the gangster rap of Mexico. All right, these are, Mexican folk songs written about drug dealers. Like El Chapo has a bunch of songs written about him, right? But they're played with accordion, and like, you know, uh, there's no funk in it, believe me. It's the unfunkiest thing ever. <laughs> but they're, they're gangster. So I went, to, I went to this bar in East LA, Boyle Heights, which is very Mexican, and uh, I saw a guy named El Commander. And El Commander has a black hat on, wears all black, has some tiny, has some, pointy cowboy boots with, with like silver spurs. He's got like diamonds and everything all over him. He's gangster, right? <laughs> and so I wanted to get it. So that's a world that I wanted. I wanted to, you, when you want, read this book, you get from East LA to Koreatown to, to, to uh, Crenshaw. I wanted to capture the LA that you don't see uh, in most movies. The fact that LA is a multicultural city. It's predominantly non-white and um, the, the cultural uh, exchange between the two, all the cultures is really interesting. Um, so back to D Hunter. Well, I'm gonna do one more thing about okay. LA. I, okay. I was in LA during the riot in 92. And uh, uh, I will never forget that experience. And 
So the idea of the riot and the connections, a disconnection between the Korean community and the black community is a sub-theme of the book. And it plays a large role in unfolding the mystery of that because I felt like that, that is one of the, uh, the things that still haunts LA. That the riot uprising, there was a whole bunch of coverage of it just recently, like a million documentaries just came out. So there's something about that moment which was quite profound. And now if you go, so I interviewed an actual, I found a Korean businesswoman, because I'd never really heard anybody from the Korean side speak about that experience. Mm. So I found this woman, she owns like a ton of mini malls on Western Boulevard, she's super successful, but in 92, she and her husband owned a little mom and pop store on Western near Pico. Mm -hmm. And she talked about, I said, why do, why do you think that there was so much disconnect between black people and, and Koreans at the time. And that happened also in Brooklyn. We had all over these mm -hmm. conflicts between the Koreans. He said, number one, when we came in, all the white people who we bought the properties from told us these black people were savages. Oh. So we're immigrants, we don't know, and we don't speak English very well. Mm -hmm. So we're already afraid. And then people, you know, black people, our body language can be a little aggressive. <laughs> it can be a little aggressive, if, you know, at, at, the, at the bodega. And so they're like, immediately afraid, they don't speak to, they don't understand, what they don't understand black slang at all. So you had this, you had this fear of immigrant culture who were already indoctrinated with white supremacy. Mm -hmm. The only place they could get, get a business was in a black community. So you had this culture clash that mm -hmm. led to a lot of violence, a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, a lot of bad things happened out of that. Mm -hmm. Subsequently now, I mean, the, the, the third or fourth generation of Koreans and black people get along really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, it's one of the more, more, more better kind of unions you see all the time. I, some of the best break dancers I know are Korean. So uh, it just shows you, so I wanted to depict that as well. I really wanted to depict that the multifaceted level in which race works and how uh, the, to make sure that the Korean voice was in the book as well. So D. Hunter travels to L.A. because of the death of his grandfather. So just give us a little bit. Right. Um, well, his, fa his grandfather is a traditional black shop owner in South Central, uh, has been uh, involved in the community since the 80s, 90s. There's a nice uh, Electra 225 that he's had, uh, <laughs> green, that he's had restored, some nice white walls. Uh, but after his murder, number one, why is he being murdered? He's an old businessman. It turns out that he's got a lot of other businesses that he's been doing over the years. He's basically a loan shark, I'll give that part away. And that, that suddenly changes the, the nature of the whole thing because if he's a loan shark, that means people owe him money. And how, you know, it's not just a robbery, that means that someone might have wanted or didn't want to pay him back. Mm -hmm. So that, that un unlocks these doors. And that's some kind of homage to Chinatown. And that, that was a film about, you see one thing, but then underneath, to me, L.A. is a very much a subterranean town. It's nice and warm, and it looks good, the palm trees. A lot but of seedy stuff going on. You dig, you dig, like, yeah. you scratch one level below the surface, and, and, and it's darkness. Right. So, I wanted to get, so, so the book is really about all of that. Uh, the, the, almost the, the grandfather's murder is an engine for this exploration of the city and music. Uh, for those who are music heads, there's a hopefully funny conversation. There's a whole long conversation between Jackie Wilson, and two guy, old, old guys arguing over Jackie Wilson and James Brown. There's a whole argument that goes on between uh, some young people between Kendrick Lamar, the game, and the West Side Connection. Who knows the West Side Connection is in the house? All right, so West Side, that, that, if you know the West Side Connection is, then you're really deep into LA hip hop, right? So it, it, uh, it, we weaved into this, the music is always a big part of all of this, the conversation. But what, prompted you to, I mean, I know you said you saw the Britney Spears picture, right. but you also loved the work of Chester Himes yes. and Walter Mosley. Yeah. So talk about how they uh, inspired you with their mystery. Right. Characters. Those of you who know Chester Himes, uh, Chester Himes is one of the great American writers, black expatriate writer who, who did some of his best work living in Paris. He created these characters, Coffin, Ed, and Gravedigger Jones. Cotton Comes to Harlem is one of the most famous books. Few of them have been made in the movies. Also, I should just put a plug in. There's a great biography of Chester Himes that just came out by a black writer named Lawrence Jackson. I highly recommend. One of the best depictions of um, the relationship between Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, mm. and Himes. It's great stuff. Mm. He definitely pulls them off the pedestal. Um, but you get to see them as men. Mm. 
-hmm. and the different rivalries that went on between all four of them. Mm. Uh, that went on. So, what's the book? What's the name? It's of just the it's called Chester P. Hines. Okay. It's a biography of Hines. I highly recommend it. Really well written. So Hines was a was the first black writer I read who wrote detective novels. Though though his detective novels are all about race and all about rage. He's a very angry guy, and he articulated it through his work. Uh, so I uh, I consider him one of my like literary uh, ancestors. Um, and so I always wanted to write in that style. I felt like I've written a lot of books on music and culture, and that's probably what I'll be best known for. But I love, I love the noir style. Because I, listen, Deanna, you've been around music. You know most music happens at night. A lot of it happens in clubs and studios and other places. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on. The this, this space between the club promoter and the drug dealer <laughs> is about that thin. It's a very thin wall. It's a thin line. It's a thin line. Yeah. So, so the criminality or certain kinds of criminality or hustles, I should maybe put it that way, hustles, and the hustle of the guy who's promoting the club and the hustle of the guy who's promoting the herb, are, you know, they're, they're very close hustles. <laughs> and so I've always seen that. Every time I've ever been out, and there, you know, whether it's New York, L.A., Philadelphia, you go to the, the if you're there late enough, is the local rapper, the local singer, the local drug dealer, uh, the local TV host, often, you know, they're all in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to, that, that led me to, to start writing these books, because there's a lot of stories I couldn't really tell in nonfiction. You know what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so D. Hunter, so it, the story basically follows him as he is. Yes. As he wanders around L.A. And also, there's actually a character who's loosely based on, uh, there's like a D'Angelo Maxwell character oh, called really? Knight. Oh, for real? So I've used him a couple of times. And he's a, he's, a, he's a once promising singer who's having some problems finishing his work. <laughs> and uh, so he, he, he finds out about Dr. Funk is around, and he wants to get one of Dr. Funk's songs or work with Dr. Funk on something to try and revive himself. And there's also a, uh, a whole thing about holograms. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw that Tupac hologram a few years ago, and there's a Michael Jackson hologram. So one of the characters in the book wants to get the rights to Dr. Funk's life to make him a hologram and take him on the road. And I thought this was kind of like a fantasy thing. I just read a thing like this week that they want to do a hologram of Frank Zappa, get the original members of the Mothers of Invention and have the hologram perform with it. So I mean, I was just kind of making this stuff up. But this, this hologram thing is real. It's happening. Right, so James Brown and, uh, and Prince might be touring together soon. Soon coming to the uptown. <laughs> yeah, soon coming to South, okay. Exactly. <laughs> so that's a big, so the idea, a lot of things about the black image, I guess, are, are, uh, interest me. And I think that the ability to, using fiction, I can be a little more playful. Uh, uh, about some of these issues with uh, the hologram thing really is interesting because who owns these images? Does the artist own the image? But if you own the image, who owns the music? What does the image mean out of context? Can you take, I mean, the Michael Jackson thing, you know, they, I mean, Michael Jackson performed, Tupac performed at a real show, right? That's going to happen again. How do we feel about that? Well, I would, I would think the intellectual property issue arises and the families, I mean, we know the people who are executors of the Michael Jackson estate, they're not playing. Right. They're not playing with his likeness. Right. You use his likeness, you are paying Catherine and the family. Right. But I mean, I'm saying that there are going to be more and more. Oh, more, more incidents, and yes. more situations yeah. where we because see holograms. We're people who, who yeah. are not as, uh, as organized. <laughs> as Organized. the Jack Jackson people are going to, you know. Yeah. So I think that's going to be one of the interesting, I want to actually kind of explore that some more. I think this idea of, is that a good thing? I mean, is there anything wrong with, with bringing back, if you could see James Brown in 1965 right now, again, from the Tammy show, and pay, would you pay money to go see that with a live I'd go band? right to YouTube.com. Uh -huh. <laughs> YouTube.com, I can see him every day. Yeah, I, I, I'm saying, but you're but saying I mean, pay to a concert to go to a venue. And then, and, and then Prince comes out next. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I wow. mean, and, and and we're only like you know we're about five minutes from that happening. Yeah, no, it's true. So I, I, I think true. that these ideas are everything that seemed fantasy at one point in our history. It's all on the table. So I'm curious because we are now in the fourth book in this series. 
uh, and you referenced the fact that we've seen films turned, right. Mosley's films, Himes films, characters come to life. Do we have an expectation of, and you are a director, a screenwriter, right. and a producer. Are there plans for you to bring we'll see. I mean, D. Hunter to Com the Commons screen? Company has the rights to the first three books, so we've been talking with Common them. Common the rapper? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's got a production company. Um, I, I just did a short film at, that showed at Urban World, which was kind of in this style, uh, called uh, D Dayton Jones, another character I've been working with. So we'll see. I mean, there's something great. I mean, I've been, I've been working a lot in TV and film the last 10, 15 years. There's something nice about writing it. It comes out and people see it and read it without any other, without any BS. Because anytime you get involved in these other things, there's only other voices in and we're gonna do this. This is my thing. I wrote it, it came out, either you like it or you don't like it, but I'm having this experience with people in the room that's very intimate. And um, it's great working in T, I worked in, like I said, I worked in the Get Down on Netflix and that, that was a big extravaganza. Uh, there's a lot of different people involved. The show turned out well, I thought, but there's something about being able to write on your typewriter and come out that, that from, a, from my point of view, is the equivalent, of, I don't know, of, of a musician going on the road and just playing their, their album as opposed to like trying to market it. It's a different en energy mm -hmm. just writing books. Uh, Are you still writing on a typewriter or do you write longhand? How do you, no, I mean, he said typewriter, right? No. It's a legitimate question. I write a, I Some writers only use typewriters. No, I, I write a notebook. I write by longhand. Longhand? Yeah. Wow, okay, look, see the reaction. And I take the, I write it out, so that's my first draft, and then I take it to the computer. Actually, for those of you, anybody, people who are on Instagram, I have a series, uh, some of you in here, I guess on Instagram. <laughs> I have a series of, of videos I do called content class, hashtag content class. And basically they're just, they're 315 Nelson George, that's the project building I grew up in. Um, 315 Nelson, I have these, there's about 20 of them. Called, three, called content class, and basically they're about writing. Uh, and they deal with a lot of these things from composing. I think that you always have to have your, you know, the freedom to just be free. Sometimes when I'm on a computer, like this, this thing is humming, it's, there's a light at me. It's looking, I can, if I'm just writing on my notebook, I can write in the subway, I can write in a coffee shop, and it's not a, it just very, feels very organic to me. Mm -hmm. I, then I take it to the computer when I'm ready to start editing it. Mm. You know. I think now is a good time to engage the audience. And do right. you want to do? Oh, we have one more thing I want to do. Okay. Uh, we have. You want to do that now? Yeah. Or you want to do it later? You, yeah. You let's tell me. engage okay. the audience and then we I can go. do that. I, I, I bow is to that, your superior knowledge. Is that good? That's very good. All right. This is collaborative. Uh, so we want to bring you in and have you ask questions of Nelson about the latest book or his career in general role. So tell us your name and. State your question or your comment, and, and don't be shy, because this is, as El Nelson said, a very intimate yeah. environment that will afford you an opportunity to speak directly to the artist. Yes, welcome. Hi, my name is Takina. Hi, Takina. It's nice to meet you, sir. Takina, a pleasure. Um, I have a question about your process. I know you're a screenwriter as well. What's the process in casting? Are you involved in that at all, or are you just, you like, you give your script and your object? It just depends on the project. I mean, we just, I did this short, we ca I cast that, I wrote it, and I directed and cast it. The Get Down, it was more, uh, there was a lot of people involved because it's Netflix, it was Sony, there were a lot of approvals that had to go in. So I think every project is different. Um, if I'm directing it, then I'm a, I, did a, I did a TV movie for Lifetime last year uh, uh, called The Real MVP about uh, Kevin Durant's mother, we shot. and. Um, the lead actress was someone I really wanted, who I knew from New York, Cassandra Freeman. Um, and so I was able to get her, Tracy Toms, another fam fantastic actress. So I was able to get a few people that I really could trust. But there were other people who like, I had to just, they, they wanted them. So uh, I think it all depends on, on the, the, each, almost each project is different. I don't think there's any one rule. Unless you're just Spike and, and you have total control over your thing, or Lee Daniels, mm -hmm. most times it's a negotiation. Yeah. Um, with the La w Queen Latifah film, Life, Life Support. Support, right. Life Support, right. um, you had? Yeah, that was a, a lot, of, I had very, a lot of control. Once we had Latifah, because she was the, that was the HBO movie I did. Um, you know, once you had Latifah, then you're good. We were able to, actually that was interesting, because we, we were able to hire some unknown people, because they felt confident 
that they had that covered. But we had the great Wendell Pierce was in that. A um, couple of other, oh, Tracy, actually, uh, Tracy Ross. Her, son, her brother, Evan, was in it and had a big part. And she actually did one day. It's one of the, I think it's one of the few dramatic roles she's ever done. She plays his sister. And she has a really incredible scene with Queen Latifah. Okay, thank you for that question. Great question. Do we have another question or comment for Nelson? Brother, right over right here. Right here. Down the breast. Um, enjoyed the get down, loved it. I'm a true hip hop head. What was your exact role in terms of um, production? I saw a lot of names inside and outside of hip hop. Was your job to keep it on the rails as far as accuracy? Or yeah, I mean, I was a producer and a writer. I wrote one full episode but I also wrote pieces of other episodes. Um, and I was, uh, I brought in uh, Grandmaster Flash, uh, Curtis Blow. I was sort of a person who was a liaison f from a lot of the old school folks. Um, and also I, I was a kid during that time. So uh, I was involved in everything from looking at the dances they did to where they were in the right sh sneakers. Um, so yeah, I was involved in all of that. It was a great, great um, experience. And, I feel when we started the show, one of my main goals was to, to develop stars, that we could find young talent. So Shamik Moore, who played um, Shaolin Fantastic, fantastic young actor. Uh, um, Justice Smith, who played the lead character, he's now just done Jurassic Park. Um, my favorite Cadillac, played by Yaya Mateen. He's about to be the villain in Aquaman. He's been shooting in Australia. The whole crew, a lot, some of the other actors, are, they're all, I feel like we, we, we brought a whole bunch of young talent to the fore. Uh, and actually, that's gonna, to me, that's going to be the legacy of the show, that the, these, ki these kids are going to continue f going forward. Well, you were sharing with me earlier that the show is very big in South America, yeah, Brazil yeah, well, specifically. Like, but then the question stands, what how is can we get a break? Right, how, how can, can we get to another season of It won't of be another season game. anytime soon. Okay. There may be, there may be, there's, there may be a movie. We had, the show was only supposed to go, in our minds, maybe one more year. We wanted to go from before there were records to before Run DMC. That was a leap because we felt like Run DMC is the beginning of the, that another era. And there's a whole era from the Rapper's Delight in '79 to '82, which people sort of don't talk much about because it was uh, a lot of the records were very disco. Uh, La Curtis Blow records, there's a whole bunch of records, What People Do For Money, Sweet G, there's a whole bunch of records where hip hop records weren't, they were still very influenced by the, by the music of R&B. And so that was gonna be the world we were gonna go into as these guys try and negotiate that thing. And uh, because also after disco quote unquote died, there was a whole thing they called club music mm -hmm. that came out out of New York, um, like, Oh God, there's so many bands. Oh, it's Jocelyn Brown records, you know, somebody else's guy. They were not mm -hmm. quote unquote disco records, but they were big club records. There was a whole world, there was a, a club that I really wanted to, to one day depict. I was hoping to do it in the second season called The Fun House. So Jelly Bean Benitez was the DJ. And like on one, one night at the clubhouse, The Fun House, you would have Run DMC, you would have Madonna, mm -hmm. you would have a band called, uh, some of those like, human league type electro band. These were all playing the same bill. So there was this mix going on uh, of, of hip, what was then hip hop or rap, right? And the new post disco dance music that Madonna kind of became part of. And Madonna's whole thing was very much, if you went to this club at the Fun House, you would have seen every girl look like Madonna. Or, or put it this way, Madonna looked like every one of those girls. They had a lace, they wore lace. Things, but they also had kind of like a, a cross, and they'd have the kind of Doc Martin's boots and the leggings, and there was a whole look that was a mix of uptown Puerto Rican girl and Brooklyn Italian girl, mm -hmm. that kind of Madonna just ripped it off, and created her own thing out of. So she came very much out of a particular milieu uh, that was very specific, and we would, so we wanted to take a couple of the girls from, who you see in the show, and they would sort of go on that track. So we had a thing laid out. We knew where we were going. Uh, we spent a lot of money. It was a very expensive show. And uh, there's a chance that we want to come back and just do that one season. But I still feel like that's a fresh area, that, that transitional period. Because once Run DMC came in, uh, and it became about beats and rhymes, then it begins to become the hip hop that we kind of know. 
But there's that other areas almost become its own own that unknown zone. Well, Curtis Blow was a big star. Yeah, another book of yours that I love, uh, the Russell Simmons right. autobiography. But that's well, actually that's actually going to be being made in maybe made into a movie. Uh, Fox has the rights to it. There's an actual writer. Actually, I can tell the writer who who writes Blackish. Oh yes. Uh, Mr. Burns Burris. Yes. Is writing a script based on that book. Let's mm. go. Cool. So we will see. It's been long in uh, gestation, but he's actually physically writing the script right now. So uh, that'll be interesting. Russell Simmons is the movie. <laughs> yes, that's one I'd pay to see. <laughs> uh, another question over here, the young lady. Yes, your name? Hi, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. I was The two, the two big things I'm working on, I'm actually writing a script for Amazon Studios now, uh, and this will be interesting. It's a, it's a film about funk. It's a sci-fi funk, funk movie. It's set in the 70s, and the basic premise is there's two young brothers who are musicians, and one of them is kidnapped by aliens, and the other one then has to figure out his, his purpose in life. Uh, and this takes place in three different periods from uh, the beginning. He gets kidnapped in like 72, then the, 70, the movie jumps to 76 and 79. And so it'll have hopefully, you know, P-Funk, it'll have Earth and Fire, because the, the funk is the, is, the, is the missing link that people don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. There's a million movies about soul singers and James Brown, there's books, there's a million movies on hip hop. Funk is the link. There is, that's the link between the two, right? Mm -hmm. And yet there's been virtually no... There's, I did a doc on funk. There may be one or two other docs There's on a funk. book being written right now about funk, and specifically as it relates to Ohio. Right. So, um, so funk is under-documented. Under it is. And so... And, and to me, funk was... It's funny. After interviewing Sly and George and Bootsy and all those guys uh, a few years ago, you realize... Funk was black hippie music. These guys would, would, were the first generation to start really doing psychedelic drugs. It's true. And, and then you have Maurice White, who was purist, but he was like into Egyptology, pyramid power, right? So you had, you had George Clinton was going for a kind of space thing that was driven by, by drugs, <laughs> be, 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 be honest. And, and Maurice was going for a space thing driven by spirituality. Mm -hmm. But Eastern spirituality, mm -hmm. you know, so you had these two different paths to enlightenment. And so I think that that's a part of what I wanted to explore. I want to explore the rootedness of the funk, but also the fact that it was music about reaching up. And so the next music that came in were church, soul music was about salvation and secular salvation through sex mm -hmm. to a great degree, right? Sexual healing. Sexual healing. <laughs> and then hip hop became about, we're going to root it down. We're going to be in the street. So... But funk, it was this thing like this, and it, but it, then the music kind of shifted into this. So I think it's interesting to use uh, these characters to explore that. And, and, and number one, it's going to be fun. If we get a bunch of funk bands on stage in the crazy outfits, ain't no one's going to be mad. I would be remiss if I didn't, <laughs> as we are discussing music, if we did not talk about the sound of Philadelphia right. uh, pursuant to Gamble Huff, Tom Bell. Right. Talk about that and its place in the pantheon of contemporary music. Well, when you look now, if you look now at the expanse and history of black music, you see that you can make the argument that the Philadelphia sound was the last great movement before the technology took over. Now, you could also I mean, there were solar records that came a little bit after, you know, and they had some great records, but that body of work that came out of Philadelphia from Gamble Huff, Tom Bell, that great Bunny Sigler, that incredible rhythm section, the horns, I mean, once the 80s hit, and the 808s came in, once Prince came in, really, and just decided to start using a Lynn drum, and then the other people were using 808s, and then the Sinclair came in, all of the, the musical bass that was the Philly sound got precluded by this other generation. So that body of work, which is a huge body of work, mm -hmm. um, is the last true organic, I guess, organic soul music, mm -hmm. I think, movement, when you look at the history now of the music as a whole. 
where you had live strings, you had live horns, you had three guitar players. You How had... about they all recorded in the same space exactly. together? So, which so does it's not a, it's happen a, it's anymore. A, it's a, it's a, Seldom a, ever. Yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, thing. And also the politics of, of the records. I mean, I remember as a kid, you'd get, the, you'd get the OJ's record or the Billy Paul record or the MFSB record, and there'd always be these little messages at the, on the, in a little paragraph at the bottom that we would all read. No, the, the <laughs> Gamble would write, you know, he, this was important. He was getting the message in the music. And Absolutely. that's also one of the slogans So there was a, there's a, there's a thing of that, that we haven't, you know, it just, also just look at this. The singing style of the men mm. that were part of that, Eddie Levert, Teddy. Mm. There was a very, an, uh, a very assertive. Even you know, you go Felipe Wynn, who's a little not as tough, but it, there was a kind of very in-your-face style of singing. Well, Felipe, who went on to perform with Clinton, right? Who was the lead singer of the um, Spinners? Spinners. So I'm just saying is that that the next generation, we haven't had almost none of the male voices that have become since. It's almost like that was a generation of very of low tenors or raspy voice singers, and that, that tradition. You were, like, you know, right. the next move was Luther and then Freddie Jackson and that came in and it's never come back around. I mean, John Legend is the closest thing in terms no. of... I'm not I'm joking. No. I'm, I'm, no. I'm, 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 and I love no, no, John no, no, Legend no, no, personally. No, 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 no I'm, I'm kind of playing because I know you're going to say that. Right. I, 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 I like John no, Legend too, but he ain't a, that. It's a point well taken. Yeah. You're right. We haven't had that. And they were really coming out of the tradition, like you said, the church. Right. Um, Gamble and Huff and Tom. Well, Tom was... He's Jamaican, so he was bringing a different kind of. He brought the right. real pretty, pretty yeah. with the stylistics and the Delphonics. He brought yeah, the really, falsetto thing going on. Yeah, that falsetto. Right, he yeah. was very entrenched in the falsetto thing, but Gamble and Huff, they brought that that gruffiness, that yeah. that come here woman, you know. And that we don't really have and that, and that, assertive and, music. And and that, and that disappeared out of the music. So the musical base was different, and the singing style was different. And exactly. Um, Few more questions, and then we want to do some giveaways. In okay, the gentleman in the rear. The ge um, there seems to be a serious. My name is Arthur. There seems to be a serious boy both in writing and in music that expresses the range that he should be expressing that is so needed today. Where do you see him writing, writing or music where the range that we uh, are you saying rage or rage? Rage, rage, R A G E. Uh, whether it was likes to use and James Baldwin at a time, and Dennis said to that of Wayne Powell, or James Brown, or Eldridge Cleaver, whether it was in writing or in music, there seemed to be a lack of rage to inspire people to act more energetically, despite the giants that were in. I don't know. I mean, I think uh, the Kendrick Lamar is doing a great job articulating that. I think he, he is the, the poet of the moment who, for his generation, is speaking. Yeah, he's our Gil Scott Heron. Yeah, so there is. And I also think, I, and, I also think and I'm going to say, say, say this as, as being 60, I don't necessarily think I'm aware of everything that's going on with what young people are listening to. So mm. I'm not going to say that they're not having that expression go on because I don't, I don't, I'm not plugged into the world. I just know that of the artists I know above ground, he is the one who's doing it the most powerfully. And I think that Jay Cole, to some degree, has done some good work. And I actually think uh, my man from Chicago, Chance the Rapper, is doing some really interesting things, because he's mixing, he's figured out how to put gospel music in hip hop. And, and it works. So I, I think that, I think, I don't, I, I think it's very easy for us as older people to go, but I do feel like there's a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah, BJ, the Chicago kid. There right. are pockets right. of artists that are protest music, which was very big in the 60s and the 70s. You can't judge everything by Migos. No, you cannot. <laughs> no, you cannot. The young lady over here, so you raise your hand. I just want to say that it is in the music today, just to like kind of piggyback on that, but it's not like James Brown or Black and I'm Proud. Like, I know or the young people today. Right. It's more like the music that I'm going to do a double entendre so you can understand we have these notebooks that have my picture on it. They're Nelson George notebooks, but they're, uh, they're giving a few away. I'm going to have some trivia questions. And I came up with one. Okay. One Philadelphia music trivia. What famous 70s funk band 
came from Philly, but had their success in another city? Oh, got him. Mays. Okay, who said it first? Who said it first? Okay, give the young kid. So that's your... Okay. Ma excuse me. Mays featuring Frankie, Frankie Beverly. Beverly. Okay. Natives of Philadelphia who moved out to Oakland. There you go. But we st they just performed at the Dell. I must have been great. And it, whenever Frankie comes to town with Mays, it's an experience. You got another one? I have two more books. Yeah. You got, you got a question? Okay, uh, here's, here's another question. Uh, okay, what group whose drummer played on most of the Gamble Huff songs went on to be part of the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack? Oh, you should, that's tricky. You should give them, a, you should them the name of the band. How? I, yeah, but I, I want them to tell. The, the founder of the group and the name of the group. Okay, who was the drummer who performed on most of the Gamble Huff songs in the studio, but he went on to establish his own group and they had a song on the Saturday Night Fever album? Nelson said I made it, what, too, too hard? I think you made it too hard. Too hard. I want to say MFSB, but I'm probably like... No. No. Yeah, no. no. In the back. Go ahead. I mean, the other one. Yes, you're right, but keep going. No, no, that's not right. Oh, she got Earl right. Okay, Nelson says. It's Earl Young of the Tramps. Right. Nelson says you get the book. Okay. All right, the Tramps. The Tramps. Okay. Okay, we did one more. One more, you. One more. Uh, come on. Oh, make we don't get. Yeah, I'm trying to make it relevant to the book. But I don't want to do. I don't want to do LA questions. Not LA questions, but maybe. There's all, yeah. Questions about. No, it's got to be Philly. It's got to be a Philly. Oh, okay. Okay. But a Philly LA questions would. Okay, work. where is Leon Huff from? Oh come on. Who said it? I'm ready. Okay. That wait. was so easy. Uh, the, uh, Nelson said that was easy. Vanessa, here we go. Actually, she said the woman in the pink gets Okay, well, the woman in the pink gets the book then. <laughs> <laughs> Leon Huff is from Camden, New Jersey. Nelson, just because you know these questions, the answers, doesn't mean that they're easy. Look, we couldn't get the Earl. We couldn't get the Earl okay. Young. Okay. Okay. I want to thank Deanna and, of course, Nelson, who's been very busy traveling around the country doing fabulous things. And Deanna is our own personal everything when it comes to entertainment. Um, there is a jazz um, open mic session here this evening. So if you would like or have some skills to get up on the stage, tonight is the night to do that. Um, Nelson is going to be signing. I, I know a lot of you have already purchased books. Um, he's going to be signing, we'll have him seated in the back, that he can sign copies of the book. And again, the support that you give to these events, every time you buy a book, that means that we can purchase a book for another child. So thank you so much, and again, the Bynums and the staff here, who've just been exceptional, and the conversation series continue. I'm Vanessa Lloyd Scambati. Thank you, Vanessa. And once again, can we give it up for Nelson George? Thank you, thank you. To Funk and Die in LA, his thank latest you. book. We appreciate you coming out and giving us your support.